Nigeria is definitely the future for Africa. Currently, we've got a population of around 200 million people. And in another 30 years, it will be 400, which is going to be massive. I think Nigeria is due for us to have a dedicated trade commissioner to focus on Nigeria. We don't have a visa session, a visa office in the whole of West Africa. So every of our application has to go to Pretoria, which is kind of hassle. That if somebody needs to go for a physical interview, it's going to be very difficult for that person to fly six hours to go to Pretoria, or for that person to fly from Accra to go to Pretoria. And I think we should be looking in that direction. So Brendan, Brendan does look after Nigeria from Accra, and so um, and he's got uh, two uh, locally engaged employees working with him in Accra. Uh, we have, and as you know, the High Commissioner is based in Abuja, and so we have been looking at uh, whether what we can do as far as Lagos is concerned. Um, and we're not necessarily going to rush in to put a trade commissioner in Lagos. I don't think Brendan wants to go across there just at the moment. Um, but we are, have been talking there. And so Kim and Brendan and I uh, went to Lagos about six weeks ago to actually interview some various consultants who might be able to work on behalf of the Australian government from a trade investment perspective. And, and we have found, I think, what we would consider an ideal candidate who has got very good capability and skills, good, good group of people working uh, in the organisation. And so we're in the process of, uh, of negotiating a contract with that person. And I think with the view that we would say, um, let's see what this organisation can do, say over a 12 month period, and then maybe have a one, another one year option and just see, start slowly and build from there. And if we can prove that model out, then look, you never know one day, we might end up uh, having permanent employees based in Lagos. Uh, we operate this model up in Morocco. We've had a, a contractor in Morocco for some time and that's worked quite effectively. But I think we certainly recognise the opportunities in Nigeria, um, but we sort of want to just take it uh, in a, a stage manner and, uh, and, and approach in that sense. And with the support from obviously uh, the, the heads of mission, with the support of the rest of the network from Austrade, as well as partners. And, uh, but focus probably on two key areas to begin with, and that's going to be sort of resources and education, but also have a look at some of these other sectors around technology that we've been talking about this afternoon. What's the biggest opportunity we're missing at the moment? What should we be going after economically that we're not going after? You need to your patch, but it may be different across. One of the things that we're actually trying to do with this medium is actually raise awareness, you know, get people, you know, more, more and I think um, Ian summed it, well, more, more culturally literate. You know, there, there is, you know, Nigeria we do take seriously. I'll go to Nigeria frequently and um, I would love for more organisations to come over to Nigeria. But to be blunt, there is a, there is a perception, you know, that it's too hard and security's a big issue and, you know, um, you don't trust anyone who sends you an email. That, we really have to think, work on that that mindset. I, I think for us just to say, oh, it's going to be this sector, we're going to bring people over, you know, it's very short-term thinking. I think you've got to have a look at it. Nigeria, you know, is the biggest economy as it stands in Africa, is the biggest population. So, I, you know, I don't know, if I'm not, hopefully not skirting the question, but I definitely think that's just one fundamental thing. And, um, you know, that's what we're trying to do with this roadshow. We're here, and I think Perth is probably the most culturally literate city about Africa. You know, I talk about education, mining, Africa Down Under, Africa Week, the way that it's expanded, the greater tendency, that to me is a given. But especially on the East Coast, I think, you know, kind of saying, consider Africa. Africa has to be part of your strategy for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Even if you don't want to jump in there, say, next year, you've got to have it on the radar. And some of those sectors in particular, healthcare, education, digital tech, it has to be part of boardroom discussions. And look, that's trying, you know, what we want to prosecute. And we can do that, and we can work with great colleagues like Jan, who can say, well, finance is an issue, look at me. And then we've got great, you know, Dentons, other people, the work Duncan does. So that's a long-winded answer. Can I just add to that, if I may? 
the AACC last year initiated this thing called Africa Day, Focus on Africa at uh, IMARC. It was a real breakthrough thing, it was hugely successful, and the purpose of doing that was that the AACC doesn't in any way represent itself, itself to be a mining organisation, and we happily cede that to AMEC, and we work with them and we nurture them to be part of what we do. What we saw was a platform for creating exactly those same opportunities for people to think through that mining is the enabler for healthcare, for education, for these things, for to bring forward companies that can say, we can do that because when the companies go, you know, the mining companies go into these remote areas, they do need infrastructure, they do need healthcare, they need the, all those other things that are education, agribusiness, which will be logical follow-ons. And it's just, a, you're quite right, Brenda, it's about creating the focus for people to say, we can do that and then try to aid and abet each other. But if I had the foresight or if I could actually do a few more things, there's a couple of areas. And first I'd say is vocational training. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on, say, uh, recruiting students to go into higher education, but um, I mean, I, I like to say, but no offence to <laughs> Denton's here, but um, you know, Africa doesn't need any more lawyers. Um, what Africa needs is, in my view, is you know, people that can build the economy. And it doesn't matter whether it's um, training nurses, training teachers, um, training people in the hospitality and tourism industry, in project management, in the building trades. And we, we've already heard about some projects um, that we've been looking at in the, the oil and gas area. To me, that is really a, a sweet spot where Australia could actually pay uh, probably a much bigger role than it does and uh, I think that would be one area that I'd say I think we're missing a little um, or let's say put it the other way around there are there are very good opportunities for Australian companies and institutions the other would be probably what I'd call more the the broad-based technology areas and I, I mentioned a couple in my speech about uh, you know fintech and financial service but it's it's really across the board as wherever you can use technology uh, whether it's in mining, in the, the mining supplies, whether it's in the agriculture, um, you know, whether it's in uh, delivery of you know, health services, whether it's in medical science and medical research. To me, I think that's another area where Australia, we have not, a, not as many as we think, but we have a number of um, technology-based companies that are very good in niches in these areas. And I think probably our, our biggest issue is trying to tell them not to look north all the time, but to to look west a little bit. And uh, because uh, what I see when I look across Africa you know, is, is a lot of opportunities, but there are sort of niche opportunities. And uh, I think they align quite well with the capability of the companies that we've got. And it's, it gets back to things like this, that we're trying to promote awareness of the opportunities. So for me, the two would be, and they're a little bit related, would be vocational training and really technology, the te technology-based components of industries. I, I agree with you on vocational education, uh, Kim. I think the statistic from the World Bank is that in the next 20 years, um, the African continent will have more young people entering the workforce than the rest of the world combined. Um, and as you say, they're not all going to you know, do PhDs. They, we, they, they need to have vocational skills. And I think one area that's really ripe for disruption across the continent is online education. Um, South Africa has excellent universities. It's got its main uh, distance education university, UNISA. I think my understanding is that um, the course material is still sent out in hard copy. It's posted out. Um, so, you know, looking down the track in 10, 20 years, I think online education and vocational education is, is going to be transformed, completely disrupted. Um, and I think I agree with you, Kim. It's a, it's, when I look at the sort of individual companies who are doing really interesting things, it's it's all niche. It's all through interesting contacts. Um, one example I came across in Perth is a Perth-based company that's won a contract to uh, manufacture signage for the light rail system in South Africa. It's a subcontract, and there's there's a manufacturing, but they're manufacturing in South Africa. They um, navigated the system there. They with their patients using. Um, you know, local agents to be able to um, navigate the, the black economic empowerment requirements, the transformation requirements, and it was fascinating talking to them. And now not only are they manufacturing for the South African market, but they're also now exporting, manufacturing in Australia, in South Africa and exporting to the UK from there. So, um, which is obviously, you know, similar, quite close, similar time zones. So I think it's about being that, that sort of niche, uh, opportunistic, 
um, business opportunities. And I do think one really untapped asset for Australia is our African diaspora. Um, it's growing, it's uh, the newest diaspora, it's incredibly diverse. I think lots of, you know, in the UK you have maybe large numbers of Kenyans and Nigerians, but for Australia it's incredibly diverse. It's from, because there's different waves. We've had not just, we've had highly skilled African diaspora from countries like Zimbabwe, but we also have really dynamic young people coming from as refugees from, um, you know, Francophone Africa, from East Africa, Somalia, Sudan, and I think that um, going down the track, that's a really, you know, they have the uh, market intelligence contacts, often are open, willing to take those risks and be the first movers. Well, um, I've got just a statement here that was made in the room over there in 2010 by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Nigeria. And he stated that he was very comfortable with the quality of of Nigerian universities, but he said that um, they didn't need any more PhDs in poetry. Um, there are about 670 universities across the continent of the university, uh, of the continent of Africa, but about 50% of the graduates are unemployed. And the huge, the huge gap is indeed, as you say, TVET. We've talked about it for some time, but I think we need to talk about how does a tra Australia take TVET so all of the trades, Kim, that you're mentioning, but we keep talking about it. This is my ninth year of hearing about it and we're not doing anything about it, or some of us aren't. And so I think we need to be, we need a plan. So to your comment, um, Duncan, we need a framework. So if you're going to go on a road show, then we actually need to have some pathways for people to be able to connect. The other part of it that, that concerns me a little bit, and it comes to experience because, you know, again, when I was with the WABC and then the Chamber, um, running business um, activities in Umpamalanga, in Limpopo, in all of the regions of South Africa, um, we, need, we need to be really clear about who to get together. And there's been a concentration on bilateral trade. And I think, you know, when Andrew was talking about partners on the ground, I think it's now time to be talking about the triangulation. Who are the other countries on the ground so you build multilateral relationships? Um, because I believe that's the way to go. So you've got Africa, you've got Ghana, you've got, um, you, so you've got Africa, you've got Australia, and maybe you've got China, or you've got Turkey, or you've got Canada. So I think multilateralism is a way to be able to build projects. And then is the Honorary Consul of Mauritius, virtually every few days, um, we get notams through from the government, and they're all government, examples of government procurements. And I'm wondering, Duncan, whether for you, for the Chamber, is there some way that you can provide a place where um, the government procurement details can come to the one-stop shop? And, and seriously, these are the sorts of things that we get through get through to us um, every few days and we circulate it. But I think we all need help as who do we go to? How do we actually get the message of opportunity to connect Australia and Africa in a, in a more dynamic way? So I'm, you know, I'm not being critical because I know I don't have all the answers. Um, but then when you're on the ground, say in Senegal and you look at um, the, the movement of the city from the peninsula. There are so many professional opportunities. Look in Sierra Leone, um, the lack of roads. Um, there are huge opportunities sitting right in front of us. How do we actually provide the information to make it happen? So that was a bit of a rave, but I'm with you, Duncan. I get very excited about this. Uh, my question is around um, how Kenya can build its potential, especially within the mining industry, because there are lots of opportunities there, but we don't really know how to build capacity and uh, how to get the training uh, e effectively so that we can be able to realize our full potential. And also, we are aware of the Comesa agreement, so we're just wondering whether it's possible to actually get funding through that connection or that link. So yes, uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, the Commissa MOU uh, and the West Australian government's been very, uh, very proactive in providing uh, expertise for capacity building workshops uh, in a number of, uh, of countries in, in Africa. 
uh, for the mining and extractives, oil and gas uh, sectors, and uh, it's been a, also a partnership with the federal uh, government of Australia through through DFAT. So we've been able to provide some some funding for uh, some experts from the West Australian government to go over and deliver training in a number of different areas for some of the ministries of, of mining and, and petroleum. Uh, but all, what I can say at the moment is, is it's it's obviously a very um, highly favoured uh, arrangement by African countries, and of course, West Australian government is certainly uh, supporting it uh, as we are at the federal government level. Um, we will keep looking for opportunities as as funding uh, permits, and and that's the uh, the big uh, issue, obviously, going forward is is the funding level to keep uh, sustaining that capacity building activity. Uh, I certainly hear more and more comments and I, I go around to some of the partner governments in, in the East African region and, and talk also to our mining companies and say, what is, what is the niche area of capacity building that ministries now need? And, and a comment that comes back to me is certainly, if you're going to do some training for uh, the public sector agencies in countries, then bring in the industry as well, so that it can more and more this can be a partnership and they can both learn um, from each other. And I think that's a, that's that will be really powerful going forward. But uh, we know there's we know there's a huge demand there for more capacity building uh, in the mining uh, and extractive sector. Um, and we'll keep looking at opportunities, but uh, yeah, we have to increasingly be creative about how we can deliver that.